All right. Um, please, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Padupat Chitiang. I'm a professor in the Department of International Relations, Faculty of Political Science, Chua Lung Khan University. It's my honor to be here today at the Faculty of Law for the event on the, um, on the, um, the book launch. The book title is Migrations in Southeast Asia. Um, the event for today, it's, it's going to be in English, and then um, there will be a translation in Thai language. For those of you who are in the room, and you want to um, use a, listen to the event in Thai, you can grab the, micro, um, the, trans, the translation machines in front of the room and then come back in here. And for those of you who are online, there will be um, a button on the Zoom link that you can use the tran um, to, to listen to the events in the Thai language as well. So it's, it depends on your preference. Um, and the events for today, so there will be a slight change in terms of the organization to the event. Um, originally, we planned to listen to the speech of um, the High Commissioner for Refugees, but due to the technical difficulties, we're going to start the event by going right into the actual activities based here from the Faculty of Law at Chalong Khan Universities. <clears throat> These events today, it's supported graciously by um, the Auschwitz Institute for the prevention of genocide, and at the same time, the Faculty of Law, um, Chua Long Khan Universities as well. Without any further ado, I think we're going to start from the opening event of today's um, book launch with um, the introductions remarks and also the welcome remarks from the deans of the Faculty of Law, Assistant Professors Dr. Parina Siwanit, following by um, the welcoming remarks from the, de the deputy executive directors of um, the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide, um, Jack Mayer Hofer. So I think we're going to jump right into the two speeches. Sabadita. Dear Professor Vitit Mantaporn, Dr. C. Prapath Hedmisi, Dr. Sharuna Vagis, Dr. Mark Kapaldi, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Faculty of Law, Jalalongkorn University, I am delighted to welcome all of you to our academic seminar on migration in Southeast Asia at our law school. We also call this seminar a book launch to give credit to Dr. Sipraphat Petmisi, our senior researcher, for her contribution in this exciting book project. I have to apologize for not being able to welcome you in person due to other commitments. Lajula has been at the forefront of human rights education in Thailand, thanks to the legacy of our very old world-class professor, Vitek Mantaporn, who has been appointed as a special rapporteur to various UN mandates, and who will be giving a keynote speech at today's seminar. Very recently, our human rights education is strengthened further when Dr. Thibrapat joins us. Her cultural achievement on the international stage, including many international publications, are self-evident and need no further explanation. Among her international publications in this book, Migration in Southeast Asia, which she co-audited and contributed with her international colleagues, it offers a comprehensive and comparative view of the migration situation in this region. Today, we are very excited to hear from three of the contributors, their views, experiences, and comments on the situation and the way forward. As Dean, I am very happy once again to see that our faculty continue to live up to our purpose and commitment, which is to become a more global research university that teaches. It is so refreshing to see that our faculty members, Professor Vt, Dr. Sibrapa, and Vice Dean, the Dr. Pawat, who is moderating the panel discussion today, participate in the global dialogue. I would like to once again thank distinguished professors and the organizing team for making today's seminar possible. I wish this seminar great success. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to say a few words at the launch of this very important book. My name is Jack Mayerhofer, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director at the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities. And we are honored to be co-organizers of this book launch for Migration in Southeast Asia, edited by Sripapa Pachamaresri 
and Mark Capaldi, and including a list of incredible authors. At the Auschwitz Institute, we were created to honor the memory of the victims of the Holocaust, to work so that their fate wouldn't be repeated. We are an organization dedicated to the prevention of genocide and other mass atrocities. Although we take a very wide view to what this work looks like in practice. We believe that atrocity prevention can take place at all stages of the conflict cycle, meaning upstream, things that we can do before conflict has begun, midstream, the things that we can do while conflict is ongoing to bring it to a close, and downstream, things that we can do after the physical manifestations of violence have ended to prevent a recurrence in the future. So we're not an organization that, for example, advocates for paying att attention to an issue only when it has reached a crisis point, but instead addressing the early upstream factors that can interrupt the process of dehumanization that can lead to large-scale identity-based violence. We have offices at Auschwitz, from which we get our name, as well as in Bucharest, Buenos Aires, Kampala, and New York. And the way that we pursue our mission is by partnering with states and civil society organizations to help build their capacity for prevention through education, training, and technical assistance programs. And given this holistic approach to prevention, one area of great importance to us has been the intersection of migration and atrocity prevention. We believe that those in migration, and particularly those that are fleeing violence and persecution in their home country, face increasing risk of identity-based violence, both in transit and in the new location in which they arrive. For this reason, starting in 2018, AIPG began a migration and atrocity prevention program, training government officials and civil society experts throughout Latin America, and particularly in Colombia, Ecuador, and Brazil, to better recognize the specific risks that target migrants and refugees and develop policies to bring them greater protection and reduce the likelihood of them suffering identity-based violence. And knowing that these issues are not unique to Latin America, we sought to expand this work and build partnerships and cooperation for programming on migration in other regions. And given her expertise and our previous cooperation together, combined with the relevance of the topic for the region, we knew that there could not be a better partner to build this program with than Sri Papa and her brilliant colleagues that we've been honored to work with. And we're very happy to now be in our second year of the project, also partnering with Chulalongkorn Law School, which seeks to reduce risks facing refugees and migrants in Thailand and in the neighboring region. And this book, Migration in Southeast Asia, is just one of many examples of why we're grateful to have such knowledgeable partners. This book addresses so much of what is the heart of our approach to prevention and why migration is such an important area of work for it. It addresses the different reasons why people migrate, the impact of citizenship and nationality, and what role that has on social and political integration. It addresses the material considerations that come with migration, such as healthcare, which has been a particularly significant component of our work in Latin America. And it also addresses the need to not only consider migration an issue when there's a massive crisis, but to think more about developing policies that prevent the need for people to ever have to flee their home country in the first place. Important, insightful academic work like this makes our job at the Auschwitz Institute possible. And we're grateful to have such dedicated partners in Thailand and in Southeast Asia. And so I'd like to congratulate the editors, Sri Papa and Mark and all of the authors on such an important contribution to the field. And to say thank you again to all of you for the opportunity to speak with you today. And I wish you all the best for a great book launch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Dean Parina and also Mr. Mayor Hoffer for the, um, the introductions and also the welcoming speeches. So now let's move on to the next part of the, today's event, which we're going to have the keynote remarks by Emeritus Professor Swithit Mantaporn from the Faculty of Law, Chulalongkorn Universities. And of course, this is his home here at the Faculty of Law, so maybe he may not need much of the introductions, but of course, I wish to do this anyway um, for it uh, as a result. Um, Professor Swithit Mantaporn was previously designated 
designated in, December, in September 2016 as the first UN independent experts on violence and discrimination based on sexual orientations and gender identities by human rights councils. And at the same time, he's also a professor emeritus of international laws here at the Faculty of Law, Chalong Khan Universities. And right now, he's serving as the UN Special Rapporteur for the human rights situations in Cambodia. So, and then he also holds many other significant events across both in Thailand and also internationally in, with regards to the human rights mechanisms. For the, today's keynote speech, Professor Switit will be discussing on the topic of why migration is not a choice, borders and migration in Southeast Asia to start the conversations moving forward for today. Without any further ado, a big round of applause to Professor Switit Kap. Good morning. Welcome to the law faculty, Chulong Korn University, in the Samyan area of Bangkok. On this great issue of migration, boon, bane, bust, or brilliant? Well, let's have a look gently, gently, with a degree of uh, optimism towards the future. First of all, let me thank the law faculty for the invitation to be here and ask you to relax a bit because we're going to have to deal with some interesting situations in a moment. Secondly, congratulations to uh, the whole team for this book. And it's quite intentional. I'm standing in between, you know, just uh, straddling the two hard covers to show you what's been produced and uh, congratulate the whole team. And then thirdly, to start off with a bit of a good encouraging story, which was from dinner last night, downstairs at the SOM, at the cafeteria of this uh, great uh, faculty. I was sitting with students who said, oh, we're going off to the US to do work, summer work in Florida and elsewhere as part of um, summer earnings, so to speak, as migrant workers of sorts, um, educational migrant workers, and they will surely enjoy that um, in terms of learning fresh from their experience as waiters maybe, um, earning a bit and seeing the world, and of course to be protected along the way. And that's the whole point of it, to enjoy it and then to be protected along the way. So those are very initial entry points to my humble presentation this morning, which is really to look at migration from the angle of whether we try to promote the choice factor or not, given the current situation globally. And um, I should start off really with a personal note. And when I think of migration, I think of visiting refugees and migrant workers and so on. But one of the first experiences was to visit Cambodian refugees along the Thai-Cambodian border in 1980, all those years ago. And one auntie pointed to my glasses and said, you, if you had been there under the Khmer Rouge, you would have been killed as an intellectual. I still remember that. I still remember that all the time. And the wheel has come its full circle because I'm happily helping Cambodians again today. So please don't be shocked. Don't be shocked. It's happening all over the world. And yet we have to be encouraged to do something about it. And that's the whole point of doing work like this and doing advocacy and communications. So let's try to look at the phenomenon slightly afresh. Number one, perception. How do we look at this? Number two, actualization. What is the actuality of the situation? At the global level, the regional level, the Thai level. Southeast Asia around us. And number three, what's the projection for the future in terms of how we can slightly look afresh and then work towards a slightly brighter future maybe, but also very challenging given our times. On the perception issue, I think it's very important to have a historical appreciation of what we're talking about. We have been here on Earth for 400,000 years as Homo sapiens. And migration has always been there, but it's become much more complicated. Today, the current issue of the day for lawyers, for lawyers, 
in terms of the International Law Commission, and most recently at my meeting with the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization last weekend, is sea level rise, sea level rise migration of people sinking and then having to leave their islands and seeking protection from pushback. And sea level rise is coming, and to Bangkok as well. And if we are to leave to seek protection over there in terms of sanctuary, are we going to be pushed back or not? And what is the solution when it's so globalized? The UN Human Rights Committee has already responded in 2020 in a case called Tetiola, Tetiota and New Zealand that non refoulement no pushback as a principle, also applies to sea level rise displaced persons even though internationally we wouldn't classify them as refugees so much because refugees come because of political persecution primarily according to the category and or um, conflicts. So that is very much up and coming. And this concerns you and I who've been around for 400,000 years. But the sea level rise or the global warming concerns others who've been here before us, including this one. The Sikalanth, the Sikalanth, the world's oldest fish is the fossil fish. This is front page today, newspaper, uh, paper I write for. The Sikalanth has been here for 400 million years. And it is also endangered. And it is the primary migrant on Earth. 400 million years. And we've been here 400,000 years. So let's put things in perspective a bit as to what's happening around us. And I would call this a certain sense of appreciation in terms of historicization of how we understand all this in terms of the challenges at stake. And today it's not just human rights writ small, but the environment writ large. Secondly, when we deal with the word choice, you and I are very lucky because we have the choice to be here, but a lot of people don't have choices for obvious reasons. And choices are shaped also by power. So basically, we must bear in mind the power factor and the disempowered and the overempowered and also the abuses of power that come into play so it doesn't just suffice to say it's human rights, etc. But we have to look at it from the power spectrum of who controls it, who has the discretion in terms of exit, influx, outflow, and so on. And how do we shape the power relations in a more humane manner? And that's why we're here, to use knowledge to help shape power relations and to have checks and balances through a knowledge base which can catalyze behavior, attitude, and advocacy, communications, to mobilize a certain understanding of the situation. And what is the word for the science of power and what we have to build in terms of checks and balances on the science of power? Well, I was looking for it. There's no complete word. It's scientia potentia or something. Scientia is the science, and potentia or potentas is power in Latin cum Greek. So I thought we'd invent a new word. But it's actually a medical word. It's called potentiation. Potentiation. Potent is power, and potentiation in, med in medical terms is... Uh, vibrancy of different nerves coming together to empower what we do. So maybe we should bear in mind how we should better use our power and push for good power usage through a certain empowerment, which is based on good power relations, which we might call potentiation, against abuse of bad, abuse of power, which is bad power usage. And thirdly, 
we are faced with pluralization of migration. The classic that everybody's involved with is the refugee, the person who is cross borders on the basis of persecution primarily and increasingly uh, also armed conflicts. But we're not just talking about refugees, uh, we're talking about internally displaced people who haven't crossed borders, who might be pushed or pulled also internally. We're also talking about migrants generally, and migrant workers tend to be those who've crossed borders, but we don't forget those who are not crossed, including the irregulars, who are the very much challenging group of the day. I mean, what happens with irregular migrant workers? What access do they have in terms of protection, social protection, medical, pay, justice? against abuses such as trafficking, smuggling, and so on. And um, those who might be on the verge of moving because of climate change and global warming, which is the new category of major concern, sea level rise. So that is the pluralization of categories that we have to bear in mind. And this year, what's quite exciting is that in 2023, which is after this book was written, the World Bank is undertaking a study on displacement. This will be the World Development Report this year of the World Bank. And they're going to look at the continuum between displacement or migration and development, particularly as linked with sustainable development goals. But actually, I, I don't think that's complete, humbly. I think we should look at it in terms of uh, what I've talked about in terms of different types of power relations. And the crunch is that migration, empowered or disempowered in terms of choice, push and pull, is or are very much linked with human rights violations, peace or lack of peace, armed conflicts or violence, lack of democracy. And I hope that when we have elections next month in Thailand, the elected people will respond well to the migration issue in terms of not only our migrants in the country, the poor, particularly as affected by COVID, but also transborder migrants, uh, migrant workers who come primarily through MOUs, but we have to deal with a lot of irregulars. And one of the issues is medical access as well as social protection as a whole. So. That is uh, the broadening of categories that we have to bear in mind. And it's quite interesting that um, it's an old debate and it's there in this World Bank study that's being done now, is whether we have to deal with voluntary nature of migration or not. And, you know, is it voluntary or not, and so on. And so it's a very old debate, and they're raising it again. I would say that actually we don't have to get into that miasma of, of, of uh, reasoning so much. Uh, but what we have to do is to respond well, effectively, at the local level to the different groups that come in uh, and who are classified by the nation state as irregulars or irregulars, illegal immigrants and the like, locally, but they're refugees internationally and so on. So the responsiveness at the local level I think is very important and the field presence is very important beyond this conceptualization and this kerfuffle about the reasoning of, of why people leave uh, when we actually have the uh, presences of different groups that we need to respond to. And yes, it's also about money of the World Bank and beyond, but it's more than that as I will talk about in a moment. So that is the perception angle. Historicization, potentiation, and pluralization as challenges. The second entry point is to look at what's actually ha having uh, an impact, having an effect happening now globally, regionally, and nationally. And so, from the lawyer's angle, and because you are at the law faculty, humbly, a little bit. And there are plenty of laws, soft law, hard law, treaties, famous uh, refugee convention to which most Asian countries are not parties, uh, 
Migrant Workers Convention of the United Nations, two Migrant Labor Conventions of the International Labor Organization, Human Rights Treaties 9, Global Compact on Refugees 2018, Global Compact on mi Migration 2018, and so on. Uh, and the word choice is actually taken from this normative framework uh, from the New York Declaration that preceded the two Global Compacts. Migration should be a choice and not a necessity. And what we're talking about is this, this, this diversity of different groups are reflected in terms of how I respond to power relations, as well as to have a historical perspective, through three dimensions. One is the international, multilateral. The second one is the regional. And the third one is the national, local. And the normative framework, I've already said what it is in terms of hard or soft law, but when you get to the local level, the normative framework is usually immigration law. And it is that, with a lot of discretion and often a lot of corruption along the way, which screens people in or out, and which then relegates them to this different categorization of groups who are disempowered, who don't have a choice when they're trying to come in. But let's not forget that that's when they're coming in, but the root causes in terms of violations in the country of origin, as well as what happens beyond. So what is the situation actually globally at this point in time. Latest data would suggest that about 300 million people are on the move this year in terms of prognostics. And if you look at the global appeal of the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner asking for help on displaced people, meaning those who are pushed out or pulled out for various reasons, such as human rights, lack of democracy, lack of peace, or lack of sustainable de development and environment, it's about, UN HCR is dealing with about 117 million displaced, both uh, refugees across borders, internally displaced, as well as stateless and others. So if you look at it quickly, uh, about 100 million are displaced because of various factors in terms of push-pull. Push and then you have the other 200 million who tend to be migrants and migrant workers who have economic reasons uh, for moving, including the students who are going to Florida very soon. They fall into that category, the second category, not, not coerced so much, but lured a bit by the economic rewards of working summertime in Florida. And how do we respond to all this is one of the quandaries in terms of the international mechanisms and local national mechanisms to respond well and humanely to all the different groups. But anyway, let's have a look at them in terms of the international, regional, and multilateral, uh, sorry, and, and the national. The critical cases of uh, forced displacements, coerced displacements, whether uh, internal or external, uh, about 100 million plus, about 30 million plus crossing borders as refugees. And the biggest caseloads today go like this. Number one, Syrians. Number two, Ukrainians. Number three, Afghans. Number four, South Sudanese, now aggravated by North, North Sudan, so to speak, including Thai coming back because of the um, conflict in, in Sudan, the old Sudan now. And then five is the Rohingya plus, the Myanmar situation. The biggest group is about seven million Syrians who are outside the country with about three million in Turkey as the biggest caseload. And internally, internal displacement of Syrians is about 7 million too. And together with those uh, who are affected by the recent earthquake. So it's about 15 million asking for assistance and protection, either locally or across the border, in Syria, which is the biggest caseload. Can you can see how huge it is. The second caseload is the Ukrainians, which is about five to six million, that's external, maybe going to Europe and so on. And then, of course, you have internal as well. 
And you can see that both situations are due to war, aggravated by earthquakes and the like. And you have to be very careful with Ukraine because Chernobyl is not far away either. And who controls that area at this moment? So it's a mix. Particularly Syria, it's a mix. It's armed conflict, aggravated by political persecution, but now with the earthquake on the border, together with all the terrorism, etc. The third one is your Afghans. They've been there for decades. They, they are known as the protected, pro protracted group who've been waiting for a solution for over five years. And traditionally, if you study this pattern of forced migration from Afghanistan to neighboring countries, it was the Pakistan people who received the most, and they should be credited for that humanitarian response. It's been there 30, 40 years. I mean, I visited them. I went to Afghan camps in Pakistan. But it's become more complicated, of course, because of COVID and because of the Taliban, who are disenfranchising women, particularly now. So lately, the outflow, the biggest outflow, is not so much into Pakistan anymore, but it's into Iran. And the biggest caseload is now in Iran of about 2 million to 3 million. And Iran should be commended for that asylum. And Iran is a part of the Refugee Convention. And Iran, as we know, also has its challenges internationally, which are very much intermingled with all the politics ultra politics that I don't need to talk about in terms of potentiation. So you can see how complicated it is. And yet, in that complicated power spectrum, people manage to be protected. Two to three million in that extremely complicated situation. Together with Pakistan, still protected. One million to two million also affected by a polycrisis of the floods last year, ultra floods, due partly to climate change. And yet, they still managed to offer asylum to people in that ultra situation, which must be commended, whatever the negativity of the politics on other fronts in terms of potentiation or the like or the dislike. And Sudan, I won't need to talk too much about Sudan because it's become more complicated now. That's also a warfare situation. Old Sudan, South Sudan, etc. The creation of new state. And then, of course, Myanmar. One to two million, at least one million outside. Mainly Rohingya, some in Thailand, and others also within Myanmar in terms of internally displaced who uh, are not just Rohingyas, they could be other groups also. Uh, the Rohingyas are a Muslim group, but there are other Muslim groups also in Myanmar who have to be protected. And all this is very much intermingled with the intransigence of the politics. You have to deal with the politics as linked with the power. It's not just a normative legal thing. And you have to know how to interlinked to pressurize the power politics to get the good power to work in terms of preferred choices rather than disempowerment, which leads to coercion and displacement. So that is the global situation. The regional situation I've talked about a little bit already. Uh, and for us, it's uh, in Thailand, uh, it's also affected very much by Rohingyas, but the Afghans are here too, Syrians are here too, we often forget. They're about you use whatever means you have to protect people. We are hopefully astute enough to use everything available and to admire, for example, that massive influx into Pakistan or Iran or in Africa, the Sudanese, 
which are still catered to, despite poverty, despite warfare, despite environmental degradation, etc. It's still possible to help a little bit. So um, that is the encouragement issue for this country, as well as this region. And yet we do have various challenges, and I wrote about this just a month ago in the newspapers. We have at least three or four groups that we should deal with. The current issue of the day in Thailand concerns at least four or five different groups. Number one, the Uyghurs, Uyghurs, they should not be in prison, please. They should not be in prison and they should be able to enjoy various solutions such as to go abroad to resettle. And one reason why they're not able to do that is because of certain bilateral personalized interests between some powers that be in this country and some powers that be in a, another country. So it is about power relations. And it's not even national policy necessarily, but it's certain vested interests which enjoy, to the detriment of others, certain power benefits reeking as linked with vested interests. So please, humane treatment of Uyghurs, one of whom died the other day in, in immigration detention. Second one is Rohingyas. Rohingyas should be dealt with just like the other Myanmar people in Thailand, the old group, who, who are in camps, sure, but they, they, they sort of, they have access to education, etc. these 90,000. Rohingyas should not be in immigration detention. They should be outside. And the current situation is that they can be taken out from immigration detention if they are seen as trafficking cases. Well, all right, that's okay at one level, but the whole point is that they shouldn't be there. If we understand the historicization, the politicization, the potentiation and the pluralization of these groups in Myanmar and beyond, it is the politics that drove us them out. It is the persecution and partly now the armed conflict that drove them out. So we can presume that they're refugees. We, we can presume that they should be protected, whatever we call them. And of course, Thailand also now has a screening procedure which can cater to those who need protection. And yet that is not being used yet to cover Rohingya and others. But the whole movement now is to, to humanize through vetting status, even though it's not perfect. So let's try to move towards more humane treatment of Rohingyas. And they should not be in immigration detention. They should be out, please, irrespective of whether they're traffic victims or not. Third group is um, new arrivals of uh, Myanmar. And uh, over the past two, three years, uh, some minorities, some political dissidents and so on, and particularly some minorities were housed in temporary shelters, temporary safety areas uh, on this side, but also maybe sort of um, enticed to move back onto Myanmar territory. And there were some reports of pushbacks also quite recently internationally. So please, uh, the armed authorities in Thailand, try to move towards a more humane approach and the better approach is exactly what we've been doing already in terms of the 90,000 of the old batch and enable them to stay temporarily and go abroad uh, as a solution or wait for a uh, return, safe return to the country of origin. And then the final group is everybody else. Um, we had these Christians, or is it um, a religious group from a certain country that uh, were arrested in, was it Pattaya recently? And there was a solution for them in terms of exit to, I think, the United States rather than be pushed back. Good on that front, but well, if that's a possible solution, why don't we sort of look to other ways of mitigating the circumstances rather than just uh, what happened to the Uyghurs many years ago in terms of basically it was a pushback to the country of origin and we can guess what happened then. And we still have Uyghurs in this country. So. That is the current situation in terms of actuality, and uh, we have to deal with the use of immigration law, sadly, still. But we have the leadership of the new anti-torture law, 
and hopefully we have a more open political process, maybe, whereby the vested bilateral interests of those who maybe came to power through abuse of power um, can also be done away with a little bit, because it is also linked with um, a very closed political situation at the top, whereby power is controlled by a small group who came to power through use of force for lack of democracy in this spectrum. And then they use the bilateral interests also to um, shape certain responses to migration in this country. Not impossible to address, but the point is to make it more transparent and to see where we go next. So that is the flavor of the day, the current flavor of the month towards the elections in Thailand. And let's hope that we can open the door a bit more towards humane management. And I don't forget migrant workers either from neighboring countries coming here or the Thais who've gone out. According to the newspapers yesterday, what, about, about 100,000 Thais went out to other countries, and maybe East Asia, maybe West Asia, and so on. And of course, the students are going to Florida. Uh, very soon. Uh, and um, this protection assistance uh, in the capacity of migrant workers is also needed. And one critical element in Thailand of those coming in, uh, including fishers uh, from neighboring countries, is to enable them to have access to basic protections, social protection, pay, right, monitoring, medical. Surely, of course, if they are regulars, but even if they're irregulars, according to the UN Convention on Migrant Workers, to which we're not parties, they should still be protected, irrespective of documentation and regularization of status. And I think a uh, critical area is emergency medical care, which is advocated, irrespective of, immigra of immigration status. And to give Thailand credit as well on education and birth registration and access to particularly primary education, and access to justice as a whole, there are guaranteed rights for everybody, irrespective of migra migration status. And of course, difficulties in implementation, but still the rights are there uh, in terms of non-discrimination. -disc and we need to use the good politics to enable them to enjoy the rights, together with advocacy by third parties, such as NGOs and so on, so on when we're here. So that is the second entry point of actualization. And because my time is nearing, the third element is, the projection for the future. And for the lawyers, of course, we love the normative framework, but it's not just the normative framework. It's uh, when you implement human rights, it's not just laws. Very often it's acts to undo bad laws rather than just have more laws or to enable us to use the immigration law well or to enable the anti-torture law to be used well to override the immigration anomalies. So, implementation in that spectrum of uh, holistic approach of good laws, good policies, good practices, good enforcement, good mechanisms, good personnel, good resourcing, good data in the area of datafication, good monitoring, good leadership, good remedies, good accountability, good mobilization, good space. And it's all linked with a whole variety of rights civil, political, economic, social, cultural rights, not just the one or the other. It's about expression, it's about assembly, it's about access to justice, about care, health, education, and beyond. So that is one projection that invites us in terms of good implementation of the better parts of what we have already, rather than just say more law, more law. All right. And this is for the, for the lawyers who love more law. But actually, there's often over-legislation of bad laws. But I want to round off by saying um, maybe there's some other entry points in terms of the empowerment that we're talking about, in terms of to the choices that we would like others to enjoy beyond what we are here as incredibly privileged people here, including here, humbly. And I think we have to, have to be very humble about addressing the plight of so many people 300 million on the move, 100 plus million coerced. So let's look at five, maybe fresh, slightly fresh entry points. Number one, let's bear in mind the intersectionality of situations and status. We've heard already in regard to Syria, it's not just armed conflicts, but it's also politics 
and relatedly, it's also the earthquake. So what we are dealing with is what we call polycrisis, which deserves preparedness. Maybe there's no panacea, there's no ultimate solution, but at least we can be prepared to address this variety, this intersectionality between different status and different situations in terms of preparedness. And you use all the means available to help. Number two, constituency. We do not forget, or should not forget, that there are people around the migrants who should not be forgotten. If it's your migrant worker sending back remitt remittances, don't forget that kids or families waiting back there. What is the impact on remittances? Or what is the impact of absences of women who are maids in other countries when the kids are left behind? There are constituencies around them, families, that we don't forget. And if it's a refugee situation, we cannot forget those surrounding refugees, the Thais and others who are around the camps. I never forgot about them. My first piece of work, 1979, 80, was partly to say, don't forget about the Thais, the local Thais affected by refugee influxes. So there are constituencies about, around the migrants who move in their different ways irrespective of whether we have to debate on whether they come voluntarily or not. Or maybe no one is really voluntary, unless you respond to the whole spectrum of civil, political, economic, social, cultural rights, democracy, peace, non-conflict, as well as sustainable de development and environmental protection. To have that choice, really. So the constituency of people, but the constituency bearing upon choices. Thirdly, leverageability. Where can we leverage good power against bad power? In Thailand, elections, please. No more coup d'etat, please. That is leverageability in terms of a more positive, open migration policy, ultimately, with accountability, not impunity either here or elsewhere. It is linked with democracy. And it is linked with leverageability in the UN or beyond the UN. The fact that Security Council doesn't function very much. We'll talk about Ukraine. Of course the veto is going to be there. We had one Security Council resolution. One Security Council res resolution that shifted the whole thing to the General Assembly on the Ukraine because everything else is blocked because of veto. And we had, yeah, we have plenty of General Assembly resolutions on the Ukraine. And what is the vote from this country, please, on the Ukraine? Well, the latest one is a bit better, isn't it? But the earlier one might have been due to power interests in terms of the way the country was seen to be voting or abstaining. It's not national policy necessarily, but power interests of some who disempower the preferred policy of what we should stand for in this country. And that's why elections, democracy, very important to open up the power space in terms of real potentiation. Leverage well through good power, check and balance against bad power. Fourthly, safety and dignity. Protection, assistance, and I don't need to talk about this field-oriented or the standards to be implemented through good laws, policies education and the like to help people, access to people. The better part of the UN must be at the field level, not sitting in New York and Geneva, just talk, talk. Let's enable them to go forward together with all the other stakeholders locally. Visit, access, help at the local level. So safety and dignity based on all the standards we're talking about, human rights treaties, refugee convention, global compacts, etc., soft law, hard law, use whatever you can as a fourth entry point. And the fifth one is what I call resourceability. It is about money, but it's more than money. And if you look at the whole spectrum in terms of power relations, it's also about good power leveraging. And many of us, I mean, I don't have much resourcing. I mean, all the UN stuff is pro bono. But I can be humbly very happy to help in ther terms of my own brain, a bit of my heart, a bit of my hand as I write those reports for free. 
So resources, but the resources, yes, more commitment. Multi-year, the UN agencies want multi-year commitment in terms of budget. But um, for us, it's often pro bono work. And that's why things like servicing local communities, uh, summer camps, helping local villages and so on, all very, very good as part of that resourceability. It's not just about money, but it's more. And the greatest resource is political will. You can't avoid the power of political will coupled with social will. And that does not come through a non-democratic system, which is not accountable. So those are the various entry points, maybe, that enable us to glance at the migration angle, the choice factor, slightly afresh. And nothing is, nothing is impossible at all. Maybe we can't solve all the problems, but we, we can be encouraged to help alleviate some of the sufferings. And one reason why education, socialization, Mobilization through knowledge, through a certain behavioral understanding in terms of attitude to help others, why that is so important, because it, it motivates. It motivates me, humbly, as someone who doesn't have very much, but can help a little bit, and it matters. It can help. The newspaper article last year stopped, maybe, pushback of some people, maybe. And in that spectrum, those of us who work on human rights, democracy, peace, sustainable development, environmental protection, can be very heartened by the fact that we might not have the power of the money or the political power of some, sadly, who abuse, but we have a certain different type of power, which is an exemplar. It is the power of knowledge, it is the power of reason, it is the power of advocacy for the preferred way, the preferred way that we should show as an option for the future. And ultimately, that culminates through education, through socialization, in this encapsulation of the power of empathy to make true heart and transformative change. Thank you. So thank you so much to Professor Vitit Mantaporn. Um, next, we would like to, I would like to invite um, Professor Sipapa to uh, give a token of appreciation to Professor Vitit. Kap. After this, it will be a break for um, 15 minutes. So right now it's 10:10. We're gonna have a break from 10 until 10:25, um, and then we're gonna come back for the discussions of, on the book and led by Professor Pawat. So for now, it's gonna be a break, and then uh, we're gonna see you back in 15 minutes after this. Thank you so much, Kap. Okay. Um, good morning, all distinguished guests, panelists, and our audience from here and from home. From work from anywhere, anywhere you are. Uh, welcome again to the Faculty of Law at Lagoon University and also to the book launch on migration and Southeast Asia. Um, I'm taking, taking over the stage from Ajahn Panupat. Thank you once again, Ajahn Panupat from Faculty of Political Science from, uh, for helping with the um, moderating and uh, introducing the, our keynote speaker, Professor Vitit Mantaporn, who spoke just now, and thank you once again to the, of course, the Dean Parina, uh, the Dean of Faculty of Law for giving the welcome remarks, and also for the AIPG uh, who sponsored this uh, exciting event. So um, for this part of the event, part of the, oh, I forgot to introduce myself once again. I'm Pawat Satyanurak. Uh, I currently work as a Vice Dean for uh, Faculty of Law on Research and Academic Resource Affairs. So uh, the book launch uh, is actually part of 
my job <laughs> to disseminate uh, information, uh, academic work of our faculty members to the public, and of course, uh, hopefully, to be of good use, of beneficial to anyone who's interested in any particular issues. Uh, for instance, for today, uh, the main focus, of course, uh, is on migration, and more specifically, on migration in Southeast Asia, which is the title of this book. Well, we've heard from Ajahn Vitit, from Professor Vitit this morning, that it, migration is a very complex issue. It, it's intertwining, it's uh, interdependent, and it's very overarching on many cross-cutting issues. Uh, we often study uh, migration from the experience of other areas in the world. For instance, um, I mean, probably we've heard so much about how many Europeans migrate to the U.S. back in many, many years ago uh, to seek a new life, and we've seen like John Smith, Pocahontas, and all those your know, Disney movies. Um, and then we've seen, you know, more in the later years, we've seen uh, you know, the Russian migrants following the World War II, the effects of the World War II. And then after that, we have seen a lot of migration flows from Venezuelan refugees, Ukrainian refugees, post-conflict, and of course, the examples that Professor Wittit gave us, uh, Afghanistan, Syria, um, all, they're, well, they have one thing in common, all those examples, they have one thing in common. These examples are not in Southeast Asia, right? So when Professor Wittit talked about, you know, well, his uh, lots of, you know, you know our outcome and key takeaways that he gave us, intersectionality, constituency, leverageability, safety, dignity, and resourceability. The fifth one, resourceability, is actually very meaningful in this particular discussion in the second part of this event. Because the power that we have, as Professor Wittit mentioned, the power of education, the power that we can discriminate the, to the public to, to you know, make people aware of the situation is the issue on resourceability. As I, and as I mentioned, uh, the, you know, the study of migration in this particular region, Southeast Asia, is quite understudied. Well, we've seen, we have seen some studies, but I would say that this book that our distinguished panelists co-edited is one of the more comprehensive uh, piece that would be very beneficial. It would be a good resource, and using Professor with his, with his term, improve the resourceability of, of migration education. So, um, for example, when we, looked up, when we look at the, the, the titles in the book, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the contributors would be in a better position to, to explain. Um, we've seen a lot of you know, interesting, uh, interesting chapters. Like, do we know about stateless Vietnamese in Thailand? Do we know about the, the integration of lo local Indonesian in the southern Philippines? Well, these are the, you know, the, the, the examples and the experience that you know, open our doors to understand more about the migration situation in Southeast Asia and contributing to the academic work and the power of education that we are here in this room uh, to, you know, to, to do. So let me start off with uh, introducing our panelists uh, today. Uh, the panelists today first uh, is Dr. Sipapa Petra Misi. Uh, but Dr. Sipapa, well, we, you know, <laughs> as the dean mentioned, we need no further introduction because of her prominent experience in the field. Um, she's a prominent human rights expert in Thailand, and with her PhD from Paris 10 University, he, she has extens extensive work experiences in migration, including refugees, statelessness, citizenships, and uh, human rights education in a more general sense. Uh, she was a former Thai representative to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, Aisha, from the year 2009 to 2012. Uh, and she is, you know, the, was invited to speak and be a guest lecturer at various international universities around the world, including the University of Oslo. 
and she was a convener, among other her many achievements, uh, convener of ASEAN University Network Human Rights Education, UN, AUNHRE. Um, and now she now joins us as a senior researcher at Faculty of Law, Jinan Kong University. So let, let me introduce uh, Dr. Mark and Dr. Taruna, and then we'll come, uh, we'll start the discussion. Dr. Mark Kapaldi, who's sitting next to Ajahn Sipapa, is another human rights uh, scholar based in Thailand, and he works at, he is a lecturer at Institute of Human Rights and Peace Studies at Mahidon University. He's also a head of the research and policy at ECPAT and child prostitution in Asian tourism. His work supports uh, and enhanced knowledge on um, protecting uh, ch children, uh, child prostitution from Asian um, tourism. And he has master's degree from University of Reading, United Kingdom, and PhD from Mahidon University. And then the third um, speaker who is joining us online from Malaysia, Dr. Charuna Vagis, uh, she's the professor at Jeffrey Shear School of Medicine and Health Science, Monash University, Malaysia. And she's, you know, her works, she works extensively on public health and educated and humanitarian. And she works also on access, on, on, uh, access to healthcare services. So uh, with the order of speaking, I may say that first, uh, this panel will start off by Dr. Mark Kapaldi, and then followed by Dr. Sipapa, and then after, the, after that by Dr. Charuna, and then we'll come back to the uh, Q&A session after the, the, uh, the panelists have uh, shared their views. So let's start first with Dr. Mark Kapaldi. Um, well, you you've wrote, I mean, of course, you are the contributors of this book, and congratulations once again. And I see that you wrote on chapter one on you know, migration present day in Southeast Asia, evolution and flows. So I think you're in the, the best position in any people in this room to tell us about the overview of the migration in Southeast Asia. So Dr. Mark, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pawat. Um, well, uh, to follow uh, Professor Vitit, I don't think I'm in a good position to give an overview. Uh, he did that so, so well. Um, uh, um, the PowerPoint, please. So yes, well, first of all, let me uh, thank uh, Chula and the Auschwitz Institute for hosting this event. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be here. Um, I'd also like to give very special thanks to Ajahn Sripapa, uh, who is the, my co-editor uh, in the production of this book. Actually, Ajahn Sripapa invited me uh, uh, to be a co-editor, and uh, it truly has been a fantastic experience. Uh, as Dr. Pawat said, um, a huge number of, uh, of researchers and experts on migration from the region contributed uh, chapters to this book, and I do think it makes it a very updated and comprehensive uh, volume, looking at a number of uh, different uh, sort of thematic issues, if you like, uh, but also the conceptual and theoretical lens that the chapters in the book uh, try to give. Um, so I had the pleasure of uh, preparing two chapters uh, for this book. Uh, the first one was sort of like the introduction, the overview, and that's what I'll briefly talk about uh, this morning. Uh, the second uh, chapter was uh, one where I looked at independent child migration uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, my professional background is actually more on uh, child protection. I worked for many uh, years in NGOs uh, looking at on, on various child protection issues. But my PhD thesis was looking at independent child migration in Thailand. Um, so uh, I was very pleased to be able to update uh, that work and and have a regional uh, look uh, in in the book. So okay, just in uh, very briefly, let me perhaps give uh, a bird's eye view of some of the uh, issues in the region and some of the data uh, that exists. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, and next, next, oh, it's coming, yep, there we go. Okay, so um, obviously data and statistics around uh, migration in, and certainly in Southeast Asia is always going to be a bit of a challenge, especially when you have so much of it being unregulated um, and so much uh, forced migration. But the uh, UN Department on Economic and Social Affairs back in 2019 estimated that there were around 10.1 million international uh, migrants in the region. And this is actually a five-fold increase uh, since the early 1990s. 46.8% um, of that, almost 50%, is of women. And this is also a, a, a change that we have seen in recent decades with the uh, feminization of uh, migration in the region. Uh, so this includes about 5 million uh, women. And when we talk about the feminization of migration, there are two aspects uh, there. It's not just the quantitative uh, side, the increase, the large increase in numbers, but it's also the qualitative aspect. The fact that more women migrants now are crossing borders than before. Um, before it used to be more internal uh, migration. Uh, how we are now seeing women more represented in uh, factories, uh, for example. Pri primarily women are still found obviously in domestic work, in the informal sector, um, in the service sector. But this has been a big change that we've seen in, in the region. As uh, Professor Vitit said, obviously this region is characterized by compound uh, mixed migration flows, primarily of irregular uh, migrants and also of uh, forced migration. In fact, the UNHCR um, estimates that there are um, 3.37 million persons of concern, as, as they call it, in the region. And this persons of concerns includes um, asylum seekers, refugees, IDPs, and also uh, stateless uh, persons. So the picture of migration in the region is very much linked to uh, the political and democratic uh, systems uh, found in South Asia, which are driven by poverty, driven by um, economic disparities, uh, persecution and exclusion. Um, Around 92% of migration in the region is, um, is intra-regional. And this is actually an increase uh, in previous decades, which is quite unusual because in most regions of the world, the rate of intra-regional uh, migration is dropping. But in this region, it's, it's increasing. And obviously, much of that is within the uh, sub-Mekong uh, region. This book was, was written during the, um, at the start, during the start of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, all of the chapters uh, touch upon the impact of this and the differentiation that we saw between uh, nationals and non-nationals in how they were protected and treated. And in fact, what the book shows is that um, the vulnerability to COVID was directly linked to um, economic uh, vulnerability as experienced by, uh, by migrants. Uh, next. So, 
What are some of the prevailing uh, dynamics? Well, perhaps not surprisingly, the neoclassic theories of uh, Ravenstein around the push and pull uh, is still uh, very uh, relevant uh, with the uh, people traveling from poor countries to uh, richer countries. In fact, 96% of migration in the region is apparently to the richest countries in the region, so Thailand, uh, Singapore, and Malaysia. And apparently 50% of all migration is actually to, in the region is to uh, Thailand. Obviously, countries with a higher population of, of young people are seeing, is, is fueling migration into uh, countries with aging populations, uh, such as uh, Singapore and uh, Thailand. The book uh, looks at um, some key theories around migration, uh, such as uh, agency, culture, and uh, gendered migration flows. Obviously, the, dias the diaspora network within the region, the shared linguistics, the shared religions, the shared uh, culture, and the ease of crossing borders uh, in the region is all um, contributing to uh, the migration uh, patterns. It's also interesting from my perspective, having looked at uh, migration of children, that um, migration in this region is seen as a rite of passage, as a transition from childhood into adulthood. And this is also where we see some of the cultural aspects at uh, play. How childhood is viewed in Southeast Asia can be different from perhaps how childhood is viewed in other parts of the world. In the West, we tend to think of children as being solely vulnerable, uh, in solely in need of protection. But in Southeast Asia and in many regions in, in the southern part of the world, the majority world, children have to sort of grow up uh, more quickly. And there is the familial obligations, there's an expectation that uh, children will, at some stage, be able to contribute uh, to, to family income, to support parents, uh, to support um, uh, siblings. Um, some of the research that I did, I ended up um, characterizing migration in the region by sort of looking at the why, the what, and the how. And for the why, uh, it was about aspirations. Why were people needing to move? Was it as economic uh, migrants? Is it because they are being forced? The what was often very much about their resilience and their personal uh, capabilities to deal with the different uh, shocks um, that they will, um, and the barriers that you find during the migratory journey. And then the how is the agency, um, their ability to be able to make decisions, uh, their freedom of m movement. In this region, we see uh, obviously a stronger focus on the criminal legal framework. Because of the large proportion of irregular migrants and, and uh, asylum seekers and refugees coming to the region, the governments in our region prefer to focus on illegal migrants. They tend to focus on, they prefer to focus on human uh, trafficking. That's not to say we don't have a big problem of human trafficking in Southeast Asia. The region is perhaps only second to South Asia for the um, scale and scope of, uh, of human trafficking. As Professor Vitit uh, talked about uh, earlier, 
a lot of it is an issue around uh, choice or no choice uh, to migrate. And do people have a real choice to stay in their countries of origin. The book looks at uh, the work done by de Haas and um, an aspirations capability framework uh, that he uses, which says unless migrants have true aspirations, have uh, contributions and capabilities that they can, uh, they can offer to a host country, then it probably isn't truly voluntary. Um, however, just to conclude on, on the prevailing dynamics, all of the old vulnerabilities are still found to exist. What we're seeing, of course, is new vu vulnerabilities like COVID-19, which is because it's, uh, it's, it's global, because it's cross-border, it is really testing the, the regional mi uh, migration governance uh, systems in place. And the last slide, please. So what are some of the roles of uh, duty bearers and stakeholders? Well, state responses should be there. Legal frameworks uh, from uh, certainly from the international level are there. But as we know, and, and Professor Vitit talked about this, um, only two countries have uh, uh, ratified the 1951 uh, Refugee Convention and the, and the Protocol. Uh, only two countries, I think, have ratified the Convention on Migrant uh, Workers. So. F uh, few uh, countries are parties to all of the relevant ILO conventions. Few are members of IOM. So, as we have seen, there is a stronger focus on smuggling and trafficking, and indeed the two 2000 uh, protocols are, are better ratified in this uh, region. ASEAN's policies um, proactively focus on the freer movement of skilled labor, which of course is in danger of exacerbating and increasing the vulnerability of uh, undocumented and irregular workers. And then finally, the, the regional responses to humanitarian crises have been limited and tended to be dealt with by individual countries, such as uh, Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. And I think there's probably uh, uh, an awareness that that one of the, the challenges to this is that the ASEAN uh, approach, the ASEAN way of uh, respect of state sovereignty and uh, non-interference approach and, and consensus is what is um, influencing these uh, weaknesses in migration governance. And I think I'm sure uh, the other presenters will touch upon this. So I think I'll leave it there, um, uh, a very uh, bird's eye overview, and I look forward to the discussion later on. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mark, for your insightful overview of the migration situation in, in this region, Southeast Asia. We've seen the st statistics uh, of the migration, and we've seen that there are, there are vulnerab vulnerabilities both the existing ones, like aging population, religious culture, for example, familial obligations, and also new vulnerabilities like the COVID-19 and the challenges posed on the states surrounding the, uh, <clears throat> the states that are po uh, faced with the situation and with the recommendations on you know, the state response and also regional responses to the challenges that uh, the region is facing today. So thank you very much for the overview of the situation. Now, we move on to the, the book itself. Of course, um, the overview was already in the book, but um, to understand more about you know, what are included in the book, including the background and the concept that are used to formulate and to build up this book, and of course, the contents in this book uh, that you know, offer 
a lot of comprehensive and comparative views of the migration situation in, in Southeast Asia. So for this important task, <laughs> I would leave to Dr. Sivapha, the contributor and the co-editor of this book, to tell us about the, the book in general and also anything that's you know, related in the book. Thank you. Thank you, Hajan Pawat. Uh, before I introduce the book to you, I would like to start by thanking uh, persons behind the book and persons behind uh, this launch as well. So I would like to, to thank uh, Professor Anna, someone that you may not know. Uh, she's teaching in Canada, but she's the one who actually wrote me and asked me to edit this book. Uh, Professor Anna Trianda Filidu, uh, who is migration chair um, um, and who is entrusting me and Mark to edit the book. Um, of course, as I said, I would like to uh, thank the Faculty of Law, Jalalungkorn University, for hosting and arranging um, the launch of the book. My special thanks uh, go to Dr. Pawat and his team his whole team um, who has been running around, uh, as well as my colleagues, uh, Sansani Parinya, Dr. Panupat, who is our MC today, and Ratuit, who is uh, providing simultaneous translation uh, for their continued and unreserved support uh, since the very beginning. Um, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude, gratitude to Professor Vichit, uh, my beloved brother, for not only providing a very thoughtful forward uh, to the book, but also for his, uh, what I say, a thought-provoking keynote uh, delivered just this morning. Um, this book actually is an official series of uh, the IMS CEO, uh, which is the International Migration Research Network. Um, the largest network of excellence on migration and diversity in the world. Um, the series is published under the editorial supervision of the IM IMIS COE Editorial Committee, uh, which includes the leading scholars from all over Europe and beyond. Um, the series is internationally peer review and is available open access. Um, for this book, I want to begin by quoting what was written um, at the very beginning of the foreword. Uh, as I said, pre kindly prepared by um, Professor Wittit uh, for the book, and it says migration should be a choice and not a necessity. Um, as we heard from both Professor Wittit and Mark, um, South Asia um, currently holds significant number of people uh, forced to displace, both internally and across international borders. Um, a large number, as we heard, um, of migrants are forced to displace. Um, it's not their choice. Um, however, despite the fact that I guess you know, the the the, the issue or concept of choice, the notion of choice, um, is debatable. Um, the association grouping, especially as in um, until now, fails to admit that increasing, increasingly countries in the region are having to deal with mixed migration flows um, due to factors that Mark has just mentioned to, to all of us. Um, the one of the um, one of the thing that um, I, I would also like to uh, mention uh, that um, the um, in many cases uh, in most of the countries that are around the region, um, the population movements have been seen as the threat by states in the region. Uh, one result is. Um, that states have become more rigid in regulating and controlling borders uh, based on the concept of uh, migration and border management. And um, unfortunately, with this approach, 
states are increasing their efforts to block or criminalize undocumented or irregular migration, reducing their opportunities uh, for people to um, legally move around. Um, these more restrictive migration policies in the region um, are not stemming the flow of migrants, uh, but instead are forcing individuals to cross borders illegally, um, increasing their vulnerability um, to the whole range of human rights abuses. And restrictive migration policies applied by uh, most states in the region not only affect uh, those crossing the borders, but also is also impacting the inclusion of those living and moving within uh, national borders. Um, I guess, you know, um, why this book? Um, traditionally, research on migration in the region has tend to focus on contexts of migration um, that are dangerous, abusive, and exploitative. Undocumented migrants and traffic victims have been very well documented, um, as is how they are vulnerable uh, to mistreatment and discrimination. Um, however, we found out that uh, the studies pertaining to, um, to stateless individuals living in states that do not recognize them as citizens, as well as refugees and asylum seekers, seem to be um, lacking. The, um, what does seem to be also lacking from migration study in the region is how to explain not only vulnerabilities, but also agencies' resilience, uh, as well as how political concepts such as borders, nation state citizenship, and political community are intertwined uh, with migration, not only from regional perspective, but also uh, nationally. Uh, this book actually is an attempt to fill um, uh, those gaps. So the entry point is the concept of borders, visible and invisible. Uh, borders here define geographical boundaries of political entities or legal jurisdiction. Um, a nation state, therefore, defines its geographical limits by territory and its demographic limits by nationality. So a national of a given state is considered as member of that particular political committee. Uh, what does it mean by this? It means that those who are not nationals are aliens or foreigners who are not usually entitled uh, to the same membership goods or the same treatment. Um, uh, in many cases, division between nationals and non-nationals um, is so clear that it creates the sense of us and them, and it perpetuates the sense of an exclusive state uh, through which there are borders that no one can pass without control or restrictions. Um, we fixed actually five objectives um, for the book. Um, of course, the first is to uh, review and update the literature available on different types of migration in South Asia. Um, the second objective is to examine the topic of migration from a range of concepts uh, and new perspectives uh, that I just mentioned earlier. Um, the third is to critically analyze how uh, political concepts uh, such as borders, nation state, uh, citizenship are uh, intertwined with migration in modern uh, day South Asia. And um, lastly, to highlight scholarly attention to less known populations and issues such as uh, what uh, Ajahn Pawat mentioned at the very beginning, Vietnamese in Thailand. Um, most of you may not know that still after so many years, some of them are still not uh, granted um, citizenship. Or people of Indonesian descent in southern Philippines or Rohingyas in Malaysia and independent Thai migrants across the region. Um, so these are, these are objectives of, of the whole book. Um, what the book covers. Um, Actually, the book addresses issues which are understudied, as I mentioned, in the region, 
um, suggest issues regarding stateless, uh, statelessness, refugees, asylum seekers, which are perceived as politically sensitive. And being sensitive issue, it means that there is less studies. Uh, a number of chapters, including the book, touch upon these issues. Um, um, the book also provides an updated overview of migration within South Asia that uh, Mark has already shared with you. Uh, the book also addresses current situation of migrant summit transboundary pandemic, uh, COVID-19, as well as issue of uh, trafficking in person from some particular perspective. Um, the book, uh, most of chapters in the book brings in some new perspective uh, which have been overlooked when it comes to understanding the migration issue. Uh, the book also tries to make meaning of the concept of borders and citizenship as well as agency and provides alternative thinking of such concepts. And, and the chapters of this book uh, contribute conceptually, theoretically, and uh, programmatically to a deeper understanding of the um, interlocking. And this term uh, is actually invented by Mark, interlocking principles of protection, uh, provision, and participation within the region's migration. Um, another thing that I would like to mention that actually um, uh, this book was researched and prepared by homegrown scholars who have been not only conducting studies on the issues, but also advocating for addressing challenges and promoting agencies and human rights of migrants. Um, all these elements uh, make this book um, distinguishable uh, from many other uh, research um, already uh, published. I uh, would like to, as editor, as co-editors together with Mark, I would like to um, end by um, extending, you know, our thank to our authors of the book for contributing um, conceptually and um, practically uh, to deeper understanding of, you know, of, of the whole issues that I just highlight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Siprapa, for um, your <clears throat> introduction and overview of this book and how the book is com has come about. You know all the the objectives and concepts, especially um, political concepts that are uh, used to also explain the evolution of the situation of migration in in Southeast Asia. So um, from now, I will. I'd like to introduce um, another speaker uh, who is joining us from Malaysia. Uh, I'm not sure if you're uh, online with us now. Yes. Yes, I am. Uh, uh, okay, good morning, Dr. Sharuna. Um, uh, let me introduce a little bit of you once again. Dr. Charuna uh, is a, a, a faculty member of the Jeffrey Shea School of Medicine and Health Science at Monash University, Malaysia. Um, she was a, she's uh, a public health researcher, educator, and humanitarian, and he, she has extensive work experience in relation to uh, healthcare services, to, in particular to HIV and mobility in South and Southeast Asia and the Middle East. So, Professor Charuna Vakis, uh, thank you very much um, for joining us. Uh, we would love to see you here, but of course, uh, it's oh, maybe more convenient for you for, to, to join us from online. Um, uh, okay, so Dr. Charuna, uh, I, I see that you wrote a, a chapter on uh, citizenship and legal status in healthcare and access to non-citizens in ASEAN, and you do the comparative study between Thailand and Malaysia on, on this issue. Actually, I have to admit that I am very intrigued by the statistics, the, you know, the raw information that, that you uh, put in, into the chapters. and for example, the medical charges and, and, and surgeries, and also the doctrine, uh, uh, the concepts of deservingness and undeservingness. So all of these, you know, tip and bits and pieces of, uh, of, of concepts and, and information, the merits of information that you put into the chapter. Um, I would like to, uh, you, you to, to 
share with us, you know, how have you, uh, you know, the come about to, to, to write this uh, interesting chapter, uh, especially on the thematic issue of on health services effects on uh, refugees and migrants, and uh, also how the current situation of COVID-19 has affected uh, them in, in particular. So, Dr. Chiruna, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Professor Pawat. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Okay, there's some feedback. Um, it, I want to start off by uh, thanking um, our illustrious editors who are on this panel today for inviting me to be part of this book. It has been a very uh, intense and rich journey, not only in working with them, but also with the other authors uh, of this publication who have made very rich contributions empirically and theoretically to the issue. Um, so I enter this space of migration from the angle of health and access to health care. And I think we all know that when we look at the access of labor migrants and refugees to health care, there are just huge problems of affordability of different kinds of barriers. Now, across the ASEAN, we have this avowed commitment to universal health coverage. And universal health coverage posits that all people have equal access to the full complement of health services, but with financial protection. And yet, in the ASEAN, and pretty much aligning with global trends, we see specific ways in which citizenship, or rather non-citizenship status and borders, create barriers to accessing healthcare. So drawing on my chapter in the book on migration in Southeast Asia, and also a chapter written by my colleague, uh, Dr. Amparita Santamaria, I want to make four points today uh, in, in this regard of uh, migrants, uh, refugees, and access to healthcare. The first is that there is a general perception that healthcare is an entitlement and or a privilege of citizens who are seen as deserving of public goods and social rights that accrue to them because they are citizens and members of a political community bound by a common national identity. And as a result of not belonging to the political community of citizens, migrants are seen as undeserving of such rights generally. And the way that this then translates into healthcare policy for migrants uh, is that in Malaysia, for example, state subsidized healthcare in public hospitals is a privilege that's only enjoyed by citizens. All non citizens, whether they are documented or undocumented, they must pay the full unsubsidized foreigners' rates at government hospitals, and it is exorbitant. If a migrant were to seek to be admitted uh, in a medical ward, they would have to pay something like 1,400 ringgit. Uh, in terms of the deficit, whereas a uh, citizen would only pay 20 ringgit. So that's about 70 times more. And if you look at surgical and ONG wards, then it's about 90 or more times. So these prices are exorbitant. And therefore, although they contribute to mandatory private health insurance, it doesn't really provide them effective coverage. Um, the second point that I want to make is that even in universal health coverage, which is supposed to expand healthcare access to all with financial protection, there are three statuses that are moved. Citizenship status, whether you're a citizen or non-citizen. Secondly, migration status, whether you're a labor migrant or a refugee. And documentation status, whether you have regular or irregular status of documentation, documented or undocumented. And what we see is that in the way these statuses intersect, they create differential access to healthcare for non-citizens even in universal health coverage, because of the different moral assessments of uh, deservingness attached to each of these statuses. And I'll give you a small example. Now, Thailand probably has you know, the most progressive of healthcare policies for migrants if you consider that, you know, in principle, you can be undocumented and still have access to a formal system of healthcare through the health insurance card scheme. However, we see that depending on the way that documentation status intersects with migration status, different migrant categories actually have different access to healthcare. 
So while the documented labor migrants enjoy equal treatment with Thai citizens working in the private sector through the social security scheme, the undocumented migrants are relegated to the HICS. And we know that the benefits of these two schemes are actually quite different. So while the HICS is actually an extremely commendable program, we see also that in the monitoring of universal health coverage in Thailand, HICH under which the migrants fall is not included in the same database that manages uh, UCS, the universal coverage scheme that covers citizens. And notably, uh, the two schemes are also you know, governed by different policy frameworks. And uh, we know that under HICS that migrants have a lot of challenges in actually accessing care. Now, this plays out a little differently in Malaysia. So we have this policy where non-citizens are paying this higher exorbitant fee compared to citizens. But the interesting thing is that the Ministry of Health has given refugees and asylum seekers a 50% off foreigners' rates. Now, this relativity in the moral assessments of deservingness, maybe we could say that they are linked to perceptions of you know, citizens as bona fide members of the political community. They are entitled to heavily subsidized rates. And maybe refugees and asylum seekers, though not always viewed favorably by the public, either on humanitarian grounds, you know, as vulnerable individuals or as individuals with credible asylum claims which have been verified by UNHCR, they are possibly viewed by the state as being deserving of this 50% discount of non-citizens' rates in public hospitals. But undocumented workers, on the other hand, who are often seen as uncredible, a burden on resources, they are not only seen as undeserving of the discount, but they are also seen as deserving of arrest and detention after obtaining treatment in public hospitals. So we see that different statuses, uh, in there are different um, assessments of this deservingness which are attached to these different statuses and they mediate these differential experiences of migrants to access to healthcare. The third point is that uh, in the way that health policies for migrant workers are created and implemented, and it can be whether it's this high user fees or exclusion from services, or whether it's the annual medical fitness test to deport those who are unhealthy, arresting undocumented migrants in hospitals, all of these health policies, we can see that they have now become a tool to control migration flows and impose borders, even in the hinterlands of the geographical jurisdiction of the state. The fourth final point that I want to make is that there are unresolved tensions in how neoliberal norms and policies in migration and development intersect with citizenship rights and the norms of universalism, underpinning universal health coverage and creating exclusions in healthcare for migrant workers. Now, both in, my, in Malaysia and in Thailand, both countries espouse the neoliberal model of migration and development. The Neoliberal ethic, as we know, of autonomy, of individual responsibility, it makes it contingent on individual migrants to retain status and functioning even when they don't have the protection of labor and social policies or the resources that give them that kind of control over their health and their bodies. Um, and we see this reflected in the literature on the problems they have with their health and health care. But at the same time, Thailand also affirms health as a human right constitutionally. Although Malaysia may not affirm it as a human right, it is com committed to universal health coverage, which takes a universalist approach to providing access. Now, although a rights-based approach to health offers internationally protected rights and universal health care coverage uh, proposes equality in the provision of access, when it comes to migrants, we see that the discourse on citizenship rights trumps human rights and any perspectives of universal access to care. And citizenship rights being much narrower because of the they are based on the exclusionary membership in a political community, citizenship rights with the neoliberal notion of autonomy, which you know, compromises the norms of social solidarity, which underpin the right to healthcare and traditional social protection models, in the way that they intersect, they chip away at the foundational principles of universalism, underpinning universal health coverage and human rights in general. And all of this came to a head during COVID-19 pandemic, which brought out of the shadows this experience of exclusion and inequity that migrants had been experiencing all along. And our colleague Amparita Santa Maria writes a riveting chapter 
comparing the case examples of migrants in Malaysia, Singapore and Thailand during COVID and her chapter to richly link citizenship rights with borders and otherness of migrants and discusses how borders were enforced on migrants during COVID-19 through myriad ways. So this book with other chapters than the ones that I have referred to use a multidisciplinary lens to interrogate the highly complex terrain of migration, the overarching legal and political context, and how legal, social, and psychological citizenship allows borders to be drawn in myriad ways to shape the lived experiences of health and healthcare of migrants in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Charuna Vakis. And, um, and I forgot to mention that because of the instability of the internet um, signals, uh, it's better for her to turn uh, to, to re keep the camera closed because of the uh, to ensure that the the voice, the audio is uh, delivered smoothly. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Charuna, once again for your contribution and interventions on on the thematic issue of the migration situation in Southeast Asia. Her chapter on the healthcare access to healthcare and service, you know, tell us about how the the, the particular impact on this very context, which you know depend on. Uh, on the migration status really have the impact on the livelihood and also on the on the on the livings of the of both the person and the families that that are the constituents around around them so uh, we, we uh, all the of the contributors have sp spoken already uh, now we are turning to the q and a session if anybody are uh, in this room or for online, would like to ask the questions to the panelists, then you are free to, to do so now. Uh, if if uh, no one from the floor, uh, we will, I think we have some questions uh, from online. Okay, so we have the, uh, the, the questions uh, from on the online audience. Uh, they, he or she would like to hear about the information on child migration in, in Southeast Asia, and especially uh, on children grow up with or without the parents during the migration. So uh, for this question, any, uh, Dr. Mark, please, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, and, and of course it's, uh, a really important and interesting topic that spans uh, a number of different uh, scenarios. Um, child migration in the region, there has been, I think, uh, a growing body of research into this in the last uh, decade. There is um, a greater interest in the issue. And uh, more importantly, perhaps research that is now um, including the voices of child migrants, so more child-centered research. So rather than looking at the issue of child migration from an adult perspective, it's, uh, the lens is, is also uh, looking at from, from the child's perspective. And this is really important because uh, so far, there has really been a unidimensional interpretation of child migration. Child migration is typically seen as a bad thing. Um, children are viewed as being vulnerable. Uh, children are viewed as being passive. We need to protect them and keep them out of the adult uh, work environment. But the reality is very different. There are um, uh, hundreds of thousands of children uh, migrating in the region, either with their parents or, as I've looked at, uh, independently. Uh, so children do have agency. They do have uh, resilience and, and capacity and can uh, adapt uh, into the work environment. Of course, inevitably, there is, particularly where these children uh, are going to be irregular workers, there's, there's always 
the presence of exploitation. And of course, it is the presence of exploitation in the context of child migrants, which from the trafficking protocol means children are automatically, child migrants are automatically classified as child traffic victims. So, because children cannot consent to exploitation, that's what the, the trafficking uh, protocol says. But it's interesting, when you look at exploitation, there is, of course, different interpretations and, and the issue of consensual exploitation. What I found in my research is that children and their parents know that they are going to be exploited, but the situation is still better for them than, say, back home. These children are often very mobile, and so they can move from job to job. So again, they can move out of the more exploitative uh, situation. So this, this gives us a more interesting paradigm to look at uh, the issue of, of child migration. And again, what I found in my research was that undocumented child migrants were not particularly exploited because they were children, but they were exploited because of being irregular and undocumented. So, I think a useful way of looking at child migration in the region is to have a continuum where on one side we have trafficking, because I'm not trying to downplay the seriousness of, of child trafficking, at the other end of that uh, continuum or spectrum is migration. And children can fall anywhere along that spectrum, and in fact, during a migratory journey can sometimes move up and down that spectrum. But if we understand that, that, that picture, then we can make sure we have policies and programs more suited to children and different parts of that spectrum. At the moment, most of the attention goes on the worst forms of child labor at the trafficking end. But there's an assumption that all children fall into that category. Lastly, sorry, I've taken a bit too long. Um, children left behind, uh, so children who have not migrated with their parents. This is quite interesting because in, in uh, some studies, it's been found that the children left behind may well have benefited financially from re remittances where parents are sending money back, but of course are uh, maybe suffering from some of the, the more social di uh, disadvantages of not having one or even both parents there looking after them. And also it's been found that it contributes to an intergenerational expectation of migra migration, so also feeding in to this um, the sort of familial obligation that I talked about earlier, an expectation that children should also migrate to sort of pay back their parents uh, later on. So uh, yeah, I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mark, for the answers uh, on child migration. Um, in, from online, we also have questions on uh, uh, is there, are there any effects from war in the region in relation to regional migration? So maybe this question is Professor Sipapa. Thank you, Ka. Um, before I address that particular question, I would like to add on what Mark uh, mentioned about child migration. Um, there are a few other things which for me, that tend to be forgotten uh, when it's come to uh, child migration with or without parents. Um, the first one is actually the access to education. Um, although, for example, in Thailand, the, educate, the um, education law of Thailand um, provide what we call education for all policy. Uh, so it's there in the law. However, implementation is quite different in the sense that uh, not 
let um, all children, especially non-citizen, uh, get access to education, um, especially those living in the so-called temporary shelters, which have been there for decades. Um, since children are not allowed to go out of the, let me call camps, uh, since children are not allowed to go out of the camps, so their chance to um, accept formal education is very minimal. Um, and this is, you know, not to mention uh, children who are not registered at all. So the second issue which I wrote in Chapter 3 is actually about um, birth registration, access to birth registration. Again, in the case of Thailand, um, Thai law is quite open. It allows um, access to birth registration to all children born on the Thai soil, regardless of legal status, which is, as I said, very open. Unfortunately, not all of them get access to birth registration. And without birth registration, which is considered a birth certificate, is considered as the very first legal document of, you know, of our life. But when you are not registered, uh, it means that you do not exist legally. So you have, you find, you know, these kind of children, and Thailand is not unique, despite very open law. Uh, this is the case of Indonesia, this is the case of um, Cambodia, this is the case of uh, Malaysia. So it's a, it's a regional phenomena, not only um, um, national, national one. Um, the to answer to the second question about effects from war on migration in South Asia, um, in a way, I share some experience with Ajahn Vitit in the sense that I uh, started working on the issue of refugees in 1977 uh, with both people from Vietnam mainly. Um, I was uh, together with a few friends of mine. I was recruited um, to um, to perform what it called um, refugee status determination. So I was, um, I was interviewing, of course, you know, both people. Of course, you know, we heard all carb stories and, and you could not really forget those carb stories. Um, the, second, um, the second experience of mine with refugees um, 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 uh, forced you know, to leave their home country by war is actually along the Thai Cambodian border, and that was in 1979. And I, like Ajahn I could not forget when we, because by the time the Thai government did not allow refugee camps on the Thai side yet. So we had to enter to walk, of course, illegally, crossing the border into Cambodian territory. The first picture that I, yeah, that I saw was, was a group of people sitting on the floor. One of them, a lady holding uh, a baby, a very young baby. Um, I realized later when we approached her that the baby already died. And she was crying because she was, she was saying, you know, where she could bury the body of her, of, of her baby because, because she thought she was already on the Thai side. And uh, for her, a ceremony and a place to bury the body was so important. With that kind of, of you know, image, it sticks into your head, into your mind. And I guess that how um, um, this kind of experience kept me working on, you know, on this particular issue. Um, when it comes to effects of the war, well, it, it, you know, at least in this region, it starts since the um, um, War of Independence, um, in Vietnam especially, you know, when people came into the northeastern part of Thailand, that's where you have a large group of Vietnamese in some particular provinces, Nong Khai, Udon Thani, in Akon Phnom. Um, they came together with, um, later became President Ho Chi Minh. So actually, Ho Chi Minh himself was recognized as refugee in Thailand. Um, of course, you know, some of them remain in Thailand. Many of them remain in Thailand. Um, and one of the chapters in the book um, highlight 
the fact that uh, a few hundreds of them still do not get access to Thai nationality, despite the agreement, bilateral, bilateral agreement between Thailand, the Thai and Vietnamese governments. Um, um, so that's, that's the first one. Uh, the second one, which is very well known, um, the genocide and civil war as well in Cambodia. And that's where you have the huge influx of refugee, uh, not only in Cambodia, but the whole Indochina. Um, so you have, you have millions of people um, fleeing the country uh, to South Asia. I think that that was the biggest wave of refugees into the region. Um, and it was called a crisis by the time. Um, by the time countries in South Asia, especially um, country of first asylum like Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, they were quite generous. Uh, by you know um, accommodating them in the camps, uh, of course, with condition that those people would have to be resettled to the third country. Um, by then, in the 70s and 80s, um, resettlement was still possible, um, so that's why they were quite okay to to receive them. Um, of course, international community was paying a lot of attention. Um, to refugees from Indochina, and you got you know very um, many countries uh, such as Canada, um, USA, Australia, France, and uh, even Japan um, uh, uh, agree to uh, accept them. So that's the second wave. Um, the third wave, actually, ethnic conflicts and civil war in Myanmar. You know we got. We got many, many groups and many waves of people from Myanmar, ethnic, and as I mentioned earlier, that some of them are still living in the so-called temporary shelters along the Thai-Myanmar border, nine of them. Um, about, um, I think the number is um, about 100,000 of them. And this is not to forget uh, what we call urban refugees, you know, people who are actually, you know, for staying um, in the cities. Um, there is no clear statistic, not only in Thailand, but also in some other countries. In fact, um, those uh, that you find in Malaysia are actually urban refugees because there is no camp. Um, they are living in different places. Um, Charuna could share with us further on this, uh, but, um, you know, hundred thousands of them there, including um, Rohingya. So you have you have uh, different uh, different groups of people uh, fleeing from war, not only from within the region but beyond. In Thailand alone, you have refugees and asylum seekers from more than forty countries, and you and you may not believe that the first th three top the first top three groups of urban refugees are coming from Somalia, from Pakistan, and from Vietnam. We do not really talk about them. So they are completely invisible you know, in the societies. And of course, you know, all these are effects of the war. And as I, I mentioned about Thailand, but groups of Syrian um, Pakistanis, they are also fleeing to um, countries like Indonesia and Malaysia in particular. So these are just some of the picture of effects of, you know, from war on migration in South Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sipapa, for, <clears throat> for your interventions on the questions on the effects of war in uh, regional migration, and also your <clears throat> your input further on, on the issue on China migration in Southeast Asia. So we still have some time left. Uh, any uh, we'll see if any, there's any more questions from the floor or from online. Oh, yes, please. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mark, for the well thought of presentation and the entire panel. Uh, I have one um, question or two, perhaps. Uh, concerning the migration 
uh, into the Southeast Asia, especially for the youth. Um, I've, I've heard about young people or youths also coming in, but I would really be interested to understand the main factors that contribute to their uh, m migration to Southeast Asia, especially of the African origin, and if also your research looks into different countries uh, from the African continent into the Southeast Asia, um, uh, into uh, yeah, from from Africa to East uh, Southeast Asia. Number two, uh, on the the healthcare component, there are yes, reality about uh, medical insurance and treatment of such, but again, could that also be linked to um, healthcare tourism that makes it a little bit uh, uncomfortable for those who are not the citizens uh, of uh, countries like Thailand so that they pay more or is it uh, just because they are foreigners? What could be the, the factors contributing to, to that? Thank you. Thank you. So we've got two questions. Uh, any more questions so we can do the answer in one time? Okay, if not, then there are two questions first relating to youth migration in Southeast Asia. So uh, maybe one of you uh, could, could answer. And also, uh, just to give the head up to Dr. Sharuna, maybe on healthcare tourism, maybe Dr. Sharuna could provide some input. So first, Dr. Mark. Thank you uh, for, for your question. Um, I guess, I, I mean, first of all, I have to be honest and say I have not done any research uh, looking at children from outside of the region uh, coming into Southeast Asia. My research has been intra-regional, uh, and, 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 and so I haven't looked at that issue of African children and youth coming into the region. When you were speaking, it did remind me of when I worked in my last job at uh, ECPAT International, where we we work, it's a, a global network on protecting children from sexual exploitation of children. And I remember we did have over the years a couple of cases of African girls actually here in Thailand being reported to us as having been trafficked from Africa for uh, basically for prostitution for the commercial uh, sex sector here. Um, but that, that's, but I say that was experience that I had with the work, not, not research. I, I guess, I mean, I think your question is also interesting if we look at the intra-regional migration of children uh, in this region and what is the purpose behind that. And I think the research I've done was, I found it very interesting that in actual fact, children migrating uh, in the region was a choice of their own. It was, they were not being forced into it. They wanted to migrate. They, they wanted to be able to contribute to the family livelihood. They wanted to experience something new. They wanted to, to live independently. They were excited by Bangkok and, and Thailand and the opportunities that they thought that it would uh, offer. Um, they were also aware of the, the, the dangers um, uh, as well. So I, I think we sometimes forget that for them it was um, it was a chance of of a new life. Obviously, though, along the way there are are, are many barriers uh, and dangers that uh, that they can face. But that aspirations that they had seemed to foster um, uh, an important sense of resilience within these children, which then helped them to cope 
with the dangers of uh, migration. So sorry, I haven't been able to answer your question very well, but hopefully that's a topic that you may be looking at uh, in your region. So thank you for the question. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Dr. Mark. Um, the question was posed on, on healthcare tourism, and maybe Dr. Chiruna, uh, are you still with us? Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, so, so thank um, you. Yep. So Malaysia and Thailand, again, are pretty much similar in their approach to instrumentalizing health and healthcare towards economic growth and development. Um, and this is a very complex terrain, which is also linked to the whole uh, privatization of healthcare that has been happening. And we know that, you know, from the 1980s with the uh, neoliberal economics, which were pushed by Reagan and Th Thatcher, and this whole trend of privatization, at least in Malaysia, which began in the late, maybe mid, late 1980s and 1990s, uh, we saw the private sector expanding in healthcare and uh, that they were actually being incentivized and the affluent population groups were actually being incentivized to use the private health care. But during the economic crisis of 1997-98, private health care uh, met with a lot of losses. And that was the time that, at least in Malaysia, that medical tourism was then promoted as a way of uh, helping the private sector. Now, if you look at the population groups, the the medical tourism is concentrated in the private sector, the private public, the private health sector, and is largely used by tourists. Either they have their own insurance or it's probably out of pocket. When it comes to migrants and refugees, the primary care is usually uh, utilized by these groups in the private uh, primary care sector and they generally use secondary care in the public health care sector. Uh, those who are documented are covered if for both primary care and they have an insurance which not fully covers them for secondary care. Similarly for refugees, so for refugees, most of them end up paying, you know, out of pocket. So I think what I'm trying to say is that uh, while there are overlaps, there are also quite distinct um, borders between the two sectors and where medical tourism intersects is more with the private sector. And that's not really a space that, uh, that that's not really a space that's used by by uh, refugees and labor migrants. However, in the, in the promotion of private health care, what we see happening is an exit. Is she still speaking in, on, in the Zoom? Okay, um, Dr. Chiruna, uh, I think we lost you for a few, um, uh, for one minute, I think. Uh, could you repeat uh, your, the, what, what you have just said? One more time, sorry. Um, just yep. the last bit? Yep, yep, just the last bit, yep. Yeah, so what I was saying is that, you know, while it might seem that there are some conflation of issues, uh, the, the, I think the stress and the, ba the reaction and the backlash on migrants is because actually uh, the investment in the public health sector is very low by the government. We are also seeing an exodus of specialists from the public to the private healthcare sector. And uh, the whole tourism is actually concentrated in the private healthcare sector. But because of these pressures in the public healthcare sector, when we see migrants using uh, public hospitals, especially for secondary care. And there are also these problems of unpaid bills quite often because the cost is so high, then, you know, policies are developed probably in reaction to this uh, phenomena to deter them from further using healthcare services. But I don't think it's really linked to medical tourism. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Chiruna, for your um, answers. Um, we have 
two more questions, but I think we can group it in one. Uh, one question, it's about what is the way to solve the asymmetry of migrants' rights between ASEAN law and each of the ASEAN members' domestic law in order to certify migrants' rights in the same standard? And another one, which is quite um, linked, is that what do you think should be the way forward to promote regional, sub-regional cooperation? Uh, for instance, ASEAN, Mali process, commitment, etc. on migration. Would the enhancement of the regular pathway help? Would that be enough? And what more can we do? I think, um, Dr. Sipapa, maybe you could. Thank you. Thank you for um, the two questions. I will be um, uh, looking at it at, uh, from one particular perspective, which is regional perspective here. Um, I think there are, there are two um, issues which are linked. Uh, one is about could we have one regional standard, which is not subject to national one? Um, and the second one is uh, if it is possible at all for, at least in the, in the case of ASEAN, uh, uh, it is possible to have uh, what I call a regional governance, regional migration governance. So I'll be addressing these uh, two particular issues. Um, my first point is actually, if you look at um, migration policy in ASEAN, um, ASEAN um, seem to be focusing on uh, labor migration only. So if you look at the regional standard, which is not legally binding, uh, you got the ASEAN declaration on the rights of migrant workers. You also have the ASEAN consensus on, you know, the right the, on the protection of the rights of migrant workers. Uh, you do have one legally binding document, which is the ASEAN Convention on Anti-Trafficking, but that is the only legally binding document. And looking at trafficking and victims of trafficking from transnational crimes perspective, not from human rights perspective. But what there is one common um, um, one common characteristic of both non-legally binding and legally binding documents within ASEAN is there is always one provision which always you know, uh, included in the declaration and the convention um, is actually is that it refers to national law. Um, so you know the problem here in ASEAN is that. Uh, there, there is regional standard, including, for example, the 2012 ASEAN Declaration, ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, which is a regional standard, and recognizes a wide range of rights, political, civil, economic, social, and cultural rights. But still, yeah, it refers to national laws. What does it mean? It means that the regional standard is subject to national laws. So I, I guess the first thing is, is actually we really have to address that. Making regional standard a regional one and not to subject to, uh, to national standard, which um, is usually different between one country uh, to another. Um, the second thing that I think is also important is the, is the question of recognition. As of now, um, only migrant workers and documented migrant workers are recognized. Um, undocumented migrants are not recognized. I am, uh, when, I, when I talk about migrants, I refer to different groups of migrants, including migrant workers, refugees, asylum seekers, and stateless persons. So not just migrant workers. I just, just, I just, um, I wrote uh, a small piece uh, as uh, one of the contributors, and I found out that for the first time, ASEAN came up with its first edition of ASEAN Migration Outlook, uh, published last year. So it's the first time in the ASEAN history that they publish a report on on um, on migration. Um, unfortunately. Uh, this particular um, report uh, focused mainly, and and I just I just quote uh, one, uh, which which was um, included in the foreword uh, written by uh, the then Secretary General, who is actually from Brunei, uh, and he stated, "The self and orderly migration of workers within and beyond the region is the key component." of realizing an 
Asian community that is politically co cohesive, economically integrated, and socially responsible. What does it mean? The reports actually focus on labor migration only um, and highlighting the problem of effective implementation of return and reintegration. So it's even focusing on return and reintegration uh, issue only. Um, who are completely forgotten from this report? As I mentioned, uh, other groups of migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, stateless persons, are completely out of the picture within ASEAN. Um, and that, that, so the problem, as I said, the problem is actually recognizing the existence the existence of other groups of migrants is extremely important because if you do not recognize them, uh, it would be completely impossible to solve the problem. Um, uh, problems start with recognizing that there are problems, you know, before you go to solutions. Um, so that's the second one. The third one that I think is also uh, 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 crucial is actually about uh, about the um, the um, uh, coming up with with a regional policy, as I mentioned in my answer to one of the question earlier, during Indochina time, you know the um, founding members of ASEAN came together because they were all affected by the influx of refugees from Indochina, um, regardless of the fact that they were not party, and they are not still party to 1951 convention, except Cambodia and Thailand. But they came together, trying to solve the problem together, and making the issue of, which was actually the crisis, making it international issue, and calling for, for, uh, for, for responsibility sharing. Now today, although some ASEAN member states continue to call for, for uh, responsibility sharing, but we hardly see sharing responsibility. Uh, what we see is actually responsibility shifting, you know, from 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 one country to another, and we can see, for example, pushing, you know, out um, uh, of the boats, loads of refugee out of the um, uh, national uh, water to international water, for example. Um, um, and I found it uh, very, very problematic in that sense. Um, and another thing, um, ASEAN member states are not equally affected by migration. You know, some countries have very good policy, for example, Singapore. In Singapore, Singapore Singaporean government always say that, oh, we don't have undocumented migrants. Uh, we do have migrant workers. We don't have refugees. Uh, Singapore was receiving refugee in the past, uh, by the way. But uh, only three countries are directly affected by migration, whatever forms, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. And of course, you know, they discuss among themselves. And they try to call for, as I said, uh, responsibility sharing, but it's very difficult because, as I said, not all countries are equally affected by, by migration here. And my last point, uh, and this is what we call uh, for within ASEAN and Bali process, is actually about coming up with, for ASEAN to come up or to include the issue of migration in their agenda, the meeting agenda. Because if you look at ASEAN meeting agenda, they don't talk about migration. So without, without inclusion of this issue into ASEAN agenda, there would be no, there would not be uh, no you know, regional solution here. And as I said, we have been advocating for regional migration governance uh, for so many years. We are still not very successful. Although the Bali process is there, and Bali process just celebrated their 20th anniversary um, last year, but they had a mutual meeting early this year. Um, um, if you look at um, at the statement issue after the mutual meeting, 
uh, we found out that it is even it was even watered, uh, watered down further uh, than uh, the one or two issues in 2016 and 18, because, for example, the term refugees and Islam seekers were not even mentioned. So it's, it, you know, it's, it's quite hard, unless and until, as I said, this issue of migration becomes a regional agenda, then we could talk about regional solution. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sipapa, for your <clears throat> for your input. Um, so I think, with the interest of time, I think uh, we uh, there's no time for more questions. But uh, if you have any more questions, then just email to the organizers, and maybe we can go back to come back to you with uh, some uh, answers. So uh, just to uh, to conclude the the event today, uh, just to weave everything together and to fuse everything together right from Professor Vitit's um, statement, um, uh, powerful statement, and up until uh, the panelists' um, contribution. Uh, I think we agree that the migration situation in Southeast Asia is evolving, and of course, it's, under, it, it's understudied. And this book is actually an addition to the understudied um, <clears throat> academic um, world that uh, they, you know, just to pr provide a platform uh, for academicians to to study on the on on the issue of migration in this region further, so in terms of uh, the what the purpose of this book has uh, done for us, and of course, thank you, thanks for to the contributors. Uh, it provides us a, a platform and also gives us a, a more power of education that uh, we talked about this morning. Uh, it you know now we now we know that. The situation in uh, on healthcare coverage in Malaysia and Thailand, how it look, how does it look like? The state, uh, the situation of stateless Vietnamese in Thailand, and also in other parts of the region, and also provide uh, the 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 the, uh, the context uh, or the content on the comparative and comprehensive context. So uh, I think with this book. As we have a power of education, I think we can move forward for better empathy for the and to, to especially to those who does not have a choice because migration is not a choice. So uh, I think we uh, I think it's time that we conclude here. Uh, thank you very much once again, uh, the Faculty of Law, AIPG. Uh, the contributors, Dr. Sipapa, Dr. Mark, and Dr. Chiruna from Malaysia, and of course, your uh, distinguished guests and audience. So thank you, and have a great lunch and weekend. Thank you. Thank you.